Hi, I'm Lacey Robinson, President and CEO of Unbound Ed, a nonprofit working to ensure that classrooms across America are delivering instruction that is grade level, engaging, affirming, and meaningful. It's what we affectionately call GLEAM. We are so excited to hear your keynote address at one of our upcoming events. So please, kick us off by telling viewers a little bit about yourself. What's your name, title, and what do you consider to be your claim to fame? Hi, Lacey. Um, well, my name is Natalie Wexler, and I am an education writer. I'm the author of, I guess this is my claim to fame, um, the author of a book called The Knowledge Gap, The Hidden Cause of America's Broken Education System and How to Fix It, which came out about three years ago. And I'm also the co-author of a book called The Writing Revolution, How to Advance Thinking Through Writing in All Subjects and Grades. And that came out in 2017. And my co-author on that book was Judith Hockman. Wonderful. Now let's dig into our dirty dozen questions. In the first half, we will have a two minute time limit. So please feel free to go a little deeper with your answers. Meanwhile, the later half will be a more rapid fire with a 30 second time limit each. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Question number one. Tell us a little bit about what we can expect from your keynote. Well, the keynote is going to hit the major points of my book, The Knowledge Gap, and focus primarily on problems with the way we've been approaching reading comprehension instruction. There's been a lot of attention to problems with the way we approach the decoding side of reading instruction, and there are significant problems there. But the problems with the way we approach reading uh, comprehension have been even more widespread, I would argue, and better hidden. And the basic problem is that we have been looking at it as uh, a matter of skills, like finding the main idea and uh, making inferences. And that if kids just practice those skills on texts on random topics that are easy for them to read, that that will equip them to find the main idea of pretty much anything that's put in front of them. But cognitive scientists have known for a long time that that is really not how reading comprehension works. Um, what's really more important than skills is how much relevant knowledge you have, either knowledge of the topic you're reading about or general academic knowledge and vocabulary. And so what that suggests is that instead of spending hours every day having kids practice these reading comprehension skills, what we really need to do is build their academic knowledge and vocabulary beginning as early as possible because um, the gap between the kids who start out with a lot of academic knowledge and vocabulary and those who don't just gets wider every year that goes by. So by the time they get to high school, it can be very wide and difficult to narrow. And so uh, the el elementary grades is the place to start. And the good news is there is a lot that teachers and schools can do to build everybody's, all kids' academic knowledge and help narrow that gap between kids at the upper and lower ends of the socioeconomic spectrum. Question number two, what are you most excited about in your current work? Well, I'd say the thing I'm most excited about uh, is the uh, really unexpected enthusiastic response that this book has met with among a lot of educators. Um, and despite the fact that, you know, I'm essentially saying, hey, you know, you've kind of been not doing what works, um, which is not an easy message to take in, especially if you've been teaching for years in the sincere belief that you're helping kids. Um, so it's it's really amazing and gratifying and um, impressive to me that so many teachers and administrators all over the country are reading this book and finding that it really resonates and changing their practice as a result, adopting curricula that are now out there that actually do focus on building academic knowledge and vocabulary rather than just having his practice, you know, the skill of the week. And um, I keep hearing amazing stories of the changes that those teachers, those administrators are seeing in the classroom where kids are not only gaining vocabulary, you know, first graders, second graders using really sophisticated words, but they're really more engaged in their learning as well. And they're developing more self-confidence, um, a different concept of who they are and what they're capable of doing. And so um, I'm thrilled to see that trend 
uh, and I very much hope it continues. Question number three, how does your own educational journey show up in your work today? Well, my own educational journey was uh, had a lot to do with luck and um, privilege. You know, I, my parents were highly educated. I was an only child, so they spoke to me as an adult almost, and I entered school with a fair amount of academic knowledge and vocabulary already under my belt, not because they were trying to give me an advantage, but that's just what happens in it. In, families where there's a higher level of education. And I went to schools where, I mean, I'm old enough that I think my education <laughs> preceded this really laser-like focus on reading and math. And when it comes to reading, these reading comprehension skills. So I was really lucky that I got a, a well-rounded, content-rich education. Uh, and um, I think it has only fueled my um, feeling that all kids should get an education like that. Um, I mean, we'll never completely level the playing field, but there's so much more that we can do for all kids to make their education journeys a little bit more like mine was. Um, so that, that's, I guess, how it's in, informed my work. Question number four. What would your high school age self think about the person that you have become today? Well, that's an interesting question um, about what my high school age self would think about the person I've become today. Um, I think that she would be surprised and actually really thrilled because I think uh, I always, I wanted to be a writer. And I, what I really wanted was to be able to use my writing to make change happen, positive change for other people. It took me a while to figure out how to do that, what what topic to focus on, et cetera. But um, that's I've eventually, uh, that's what I feel I've been able to do. Um, and it's, as I mentioned, it's really gratifying um, to know that my writing is having this positive impact not only on teachers' lives, but on the lives of the, the kids that they teach. I mean, obviously, I'm not doing this all by myself. And difficult as it is to write a book, it's even harder to make change actually happen on the ground. So, uh, but to be able to sort of, you know, be the catalyst to some extent for that kind of positive change, um, I think my high school self would have been just thrilled beyond belief to see that happen. Question number five, what is a challenge presently impeding your work's progress? Well, there are lots of challenges out there. And uh, I think what we have is a very intricate sort of superstructure, all focused on these reading comprehension skills, you know, progress monitoring and tests, end of the year state tests, et cetera. Um, that really rest on a very flawed foundation. And so even if you recognize that the premise of all of this stuff is flawed, it's it's hard, I think, for educators, administrators to really get away from focusing on these skills because there is just so much focus on them in tests and curricula and um, evaluation of teachers and all sorts of things. So uh, I, it's it's hard sometimes when I um, you know I'm asked like well what what can I do you know what what if I'm the only teacher in my building who feels we need to have some change make some change happen or I'm the only I seem to be the only parent in my school district that has recognized that this change needs to happen it's very hard for me to know uh, what to say um, I think there's strength in numbers and I think the more people that recognize that this foundation we're standing on is flawed. Uh, the more likely changes to happen but it's not going to happen overnight um, because knowledge building for one thing is a gradual cumulative process so it takes a while to see the results especially in standardized tests and also it's like kind of like turning around the titanic you know we just have this very intricate elaborate structure that i think we're all kind of trapped in um, but there are as i say there are lots of teachers in districts that are making this change happen despite those obstacles. Well, 
We've reached our final question of this section. Question number six. What is a project that you still long to begin or complete? Well, there's a project that I was thinking of completing, um, and I now kind of wish somebody else would, would pick up that idea because uh, I think it's really important, but I, I'm not sure uh, I have it in me to undertake it myself. And that is to take a good look at what goes on in teacher training programs and schools of education and how what teachers are being you know, trained to believe, um, how that relates to what cognitive scientists have discovered about how the learning process actually works. Uh, I, I don't, you know, there, there's no one institution really that's responsible for the current mess that we're in with this reading comprehension scheme. But, um, but I do think a, a lot of the problem goes back to how teachers are trained. And, and really, you know, it's not the fault of individuals. It's a systemic problem. The um, history of schools of education has proceeded on a different track from the history of the rest of academia. And so there's just very little communication between the ed school on a campus and say the psychology department on the same campus. And they may be teaching things that are diametrically opposed. Uh, and so we're, we're in a situation where to make teachers' jobs easier, essentially, we, we need to sort of retrain them on the job um, and, and introduce them to ideas that it would have been much better to introduce them to during their pre-service training. Um, so I, uh, if anybody out there is listening, I think what would be ideal is for someone who's actually been through a school of education to reflect on that experience and uh, also research what cognitive science has found about the learning process and, and talk about how these two things have just diverged to the detriment of many teachers and many, many students. Thank you for your thoughtful answers so far. Now we jump to our lightning round. Ooh, I love this part. Where the response time is just 30 seconds. Enough time to give your answer with a little detail and context if you choose. Okay, are you ready? Question number one. What book would you say is a must read for our participants? Well, that's kind of a tough one because there are a lot of books that I've relied on, um, but I'm gonna choose one called Seven Myths About Education by Daisy Christodoulou, um, who is a British educator and writer about education. And this goes beyond the problems with reading comprehension instruction to tackle a whole bunch of aspects of uh, the way we approach teaching that really don't line up with what cognitive science has found. Um, so, and it's, it's, it's not long. And as you can see, I've, I got a lot out of it because look at all these post-its. Question number two. Who are your heroes or sheroes that have influenced your work? Well, again, I, there are lots, lots of possible, possible heroes for me or sheroes for me to choose from, but I'm gonna say um, the teacher who let me into her classroom very bravely and allowed me to follow her class through a school year, um, who um, was incredibly hardworking, dedicated, and just, really smart in the way she was using this curriculum to build her, her second graders knowledge and also to interact with them as human beings. Um, so I'm grateful to her. I'm in awe of her uh, abilities. Her name is Liz Massey. What is a constant truth or consistent fact about you? Well, that's a tough one. I guess I'd, I'd have to say that I'm, I'm persistent. Uh, you know, I, I guess I have a certain amount of resilience because um, there were a lot of obstacles in the way uh, to writing this book and seeing it come out. And there were definitely times when I felt like I can't do this, but I realized it was important and I just kept pushing myself to, to continue. Um, and I'm really glad I did. What tune do you consider to be your theme song? Well, I'm not sure I really have a theme song, but if pressed, maybe I would say something like the sun will come out tomorrow from Annie, because, um, you know, I think it's important to remain optimistic and um, hope for the best. And so that's what I try to do. If you weren't doing this work, what else would you be doing right now? Well, I'm really glad to be doing this work because it's it's hard for me to imagine 
doing anything that I would enjoy more or find more gratifying. But what I was doing before I started writing about education was um, I was writing novels. And um, that's also gratifying and enjoyable. Uh, so I probably maybe still be trying to write novels. Um, I wrote three. But uh, the work I'm doing now is it feels a lot more important, even though I'm proud of my novels. But, you know, I feel like I'm changing lives now. So that's a little harder to do with a novel. What do you want the audience to know, feel, or do after your keynote? Well, I guess I'd like them to know why some of the approaches they've been taking maybe have not been working. Um, I'd like them not to feel guilty, although I know that can be hard. I'd like them to feel that now that they know better, they'll do better. Um, I think, you know, it is not anyone's fault if they were not given accurate information. But once you do get that information, then it's your obligation to act on it. Okay, thank you so much. That's it for your Meet the Speaker interview. I hope it wasn't too painful to go through. I truly hope you've enjoyed yourself and that the viewers will be even more fired up about hearing your full keynote address at our upcoming event. I'd love for you to have the final word. So please take a few seconds and give us some final thoughts for our attendees. Well, first of all, thank you, Lacey, for those thought provoking questions. I did enjoy this. Um, and I think my final thoughts would be that I know this has been a tough couple of years for teachers and it can feel like you're just holding your head above water and taking on one more thing trying to change what you're doing might just seem like too much. And I understand that. But I would say um, we just don't have the luxury of going back to what we were doing before, which wasn't working before, when the situation is even more dire now after a period of remote schooling. So it is more important than ever to switch to methods that do work. And although there may be a learning curve, there may be some challenges, once you get past that initial period of learning, uh, I predict it's going to make your job easier and more gratifying. Uh, so um, that's what I would want to leave you with. Thanks again.